Sweet. Uh, so three kind of ways to understand pressure that we'll try to unpack tonight. Uh, one of them being uh, the pressure gauge. Um, during COVID, we came up with that kind of ways or, or lenses of watching rugby. Um, a lot of people kind of gravitated towards that, that pressure gauge, you know, towards the attack or defense. Um, you know, who is owning pressure or who's applying pressure. And we'll also look at, you know, how to read breakdown in space um, in context. So, you know, that that contest and then that offside space that exists away from that contest um, and how we can zoom in and zoom out depending on what the game presents us. And hopefully we'll get to a stage where everyone kind of has a clear definition of what pressure looks like um, in a game. Um, and just as a, an aside, um, we have talked about pressure being, you know, a mental piece as well um, as, a, as a contextual piece, a storyline. What we're talking about today is mainly pressure on the teams rather than transferring pressure um, onto ourselves. So very briefly, I'll throw into the chat if, if, folks have not seen it already, um, but basically an introduction to the pressure gauge. Um, it's a sliding scale that is dynamic. Um, it can change based on an action on the field or based on a sequence of actions. Um, and effectively the process questions that, you know, stakeholders or watchers of rugby um, at home or, you know, in the stands uh, subconsciously ask each other all the time is which team's under pressure, by how much, and what are they going to do about it? And that could be illegal or spectacular. Uh, so I will pop this um, kind of explanation video into the into the chat if you want to watch it um, later on, just so that I don't assume that everyone understands um, kind of what this pressure gauge is. So if you give me a sec, I'll pop that um, into the chat just now. Apologies for the delay, everyone. And very briefly, just so that everyone's aware of what it looks like, um, effectively, we just want to be aware of kind of when that big moment happens. So um, as this example dictates, um, a box kick is a moment where pressure can change, either it's a really good kick um, or a poor kick, which could affect which team's under pressure. Um, obviously, a, a collision um, or the tackle, depending on, on who owns that, will affect, you know, which team is kind of owning it. And as we see down at the bottom of the screen, uh, that pressure gauge, you know, is rarely in the middle. It often slides, you know, in favor of the defense or in favor of the attack. Um, but I'll leave that for you to watch at your leisure. So that's one of the tools we'll be consistently referring back to uh, when we talk about pressure gauge. So that second uh, tool or way of looking at it, so the pressure gauge obviously being the most simple and um, an applied version of that would be reading the breakdown in contest. Uh, and this is that you know red, amber, green uh, analysis of before every collision. So we, we use that pressure gauge to inform ourselves kind of what kind of collision we're gonna see, whether that is um, you know a green uh, collision or, or ruck, uh, which predominantly is a carry over the gain line or attacking point of contact dominance with support. Um, 
occasionally we see the yellow or amber where we have that neutral carry or the support is maybe a little bit late. Um, and then we have our red um, collision, which is, you know, a negative gain line carry or the defensive point of contact dominance or limited space. Um, and again, I'll just share the um, that video for folks who want to take a more in-depth look um, on their own time. But effectively, that's another way to look at the clips we'll be exploring this evening um, is just that traffic light analysis of what I'm about to see. Is this going to be a green? Um, what does that mean? Is that going to be yellow? What does that mean? All right, so that tool is in the chat for you now. And just before we get to our discussion clips and, and pop us into our discussion groups for this evening, uh, what we mean by green, just as a bit of an expansion, um, is pretty much we're moving straight on from the contest or job one, as some people refer to it as, and we go straight to the space. So uh, effectively, unless something horrible happens with the tackler, um, you know, ending up on the wrong side or kicking the ball away from the ball carrier, um, we're, we're pretty much moving on to the next thing, um, which is the space. Um, in a yellow or amber situation, a little bit more complex, um, shows that image quite deliberately where we've got a couple things to look at, whether it's, you know, the cleaner, um, in which case we can make uh, an observation here on what that action is or the Jacqueline, what they're doing. Um, and we base all of our observations on the key focus areas and our definitions that we, um, you know, that we try to develop in our, in our brains over time. Uh, but effectively, this is a tool to help us ID kind of who or what um, is going to be the difference maker um, as a primary threat or secondary threat, if that makes sense to everyone. And then of course, um, in a red situation, we would say that, okay, the ball carrying team is under heaps of pressure um, and what are they gonna do to keep the ball, if that makes sense. Um, so that's just one way to look at it. If it's like too complicated, this traffic like thing, um, just go back to the very basics of the pressure gauge, try to pick out which team's under pressure and what they're about to do to cope with it if that makes sense, just to give you an advantage um, as we head into our clips for this evening. Uh, but just as a pause there, does anyone have any questions, comments, anecdotes on either pressure gauge or kind of this way of looking at the breakdown contextually? Sweet. So I will pop into the chat right now, the session clips, um, just so you can watch them on your own screen rather than accepting the lag that will be on a shared screen. All right, here they are. Just test them to make sure they work. Excellent. Cool. So we will look at, at clip one um, in the next 10 seconds or so. So I'll uh, pause to give everyone an opportunity to open that um, on another tab. Um, but effectively, what we're going to do here in the first clip is see if we can identify if we consider this a, a green, um, yellow, or red clip in that sense. So um, green meaning there's no way uh, or credible way that the defense would probably um, win in this situation. Uh, yellow meaning well, it's, it's pretty close. Um, I want to see what the contest looks like. And red meaning the attack's in trouble and the defense should probably win. So uh, I'll open up um, a quick little poll here and we will just quite simply answer, do we think it's green, yellow, or red? And of course, I will share um, clip one at a reduced speed on my screen in the next few seconds.
That has been launched right now. I will just share the clip on my screen if I could. We'll give everyone to the end of this clip on my screen. Sweet. Uh, all right. So we've had 14 of 15 to 23 answer. So just pop your projection into that clip. Is it a green, red, or amber or yellow cliff. All right, we will end it there. So um, looking at what most people have come up with, uh, the vast majority, 72%, think uh, it's a genuine yellow collision where ooh, I want to have a look at the jackpot versus the queen out. Um, you know, and not necessarily those singular things, but we're, we're looking at that contest. Um, few people have said it's going to be a quick ball scenario. And then some people think that the support is in trouble. Um, and I will add that we try not to, as much as possible, look at the actual refereeing decision, uh, correct or otherwise. It's more about um, how we get to that decision, if that makes sense. Um, so as we get to the impact moment where the collision happens, I'll pause it right here. Um, could someone who is in the red category, meaning the attack is in trouble, um yeah unmute fire in the chat uh let us know your thoughts and why hey chris jeremy hey jeremy uh so i started with the wrong video so that's why it's delay i just felt that they like everyone sort of killed killed the ball like it wasn't green because it wasn't gonna be a fast ball and then i didn't really think it was yellow more because i felt that there wasn't any clear jackaler um like wasn't any clear sort of support off feet like everyone dove over off their feet so i thought it was going to be cynical play in my mind because everyone ended up on the ground so i said that the only thing i could come up with from that was that i would be red because right. I didn't, so um I didn't we'll try to, yeah, possession one. Of the ball i guess is what i yeah, and we'll we'll try to shift your thinking a little bit in the sense that um, when we talk about you know this this way of thinking about it, red, amber, green, it's all about like kind of who owns that pressure. So red would be the defense has smashed them backwards, and the attack has no hope. Um, so if we rewind a little bit, if you're able to see my screen, uh, let's look at the origin of this phase. So we've got the uh, the ruck happening about five meters ahead of halfway. Um, you know, we get a reasonable pass, first defender beaten, we kind of get this uh, tackle, um, you know, tackle, tackle, assist picture, um, and we see as they're getting up, it, it is over the gain line. So by definition, when we talk about, you know, a red ruck, as some of the coaches would, would uh, refer to it as in their analysis, when they, they would consider that defensive dominant tackle behind the gain line, if that makes sense. So a lot of people yeah, said yellow. I just I saw Philip's comment. I'm like, don't don't follow my comments because I missed the beginning videos when I was no no I good. I, so I don't think I was in I, understanding the green, yellow, red properly. No, no, no worries at all. But what I what I'm hearing though is like there there's some chaos here. Like there's something to be refereed if that makes sense. For sure. Sweet. So I I guess the next step is whether we say you know red, green, yellow it is. Well, we have something to referee here. So um, if we have this scenario where we've got people standing up and holding each other um, about to go to the ground and there they do, now we have to then 
consider, okay, we've, we've made ourselves over the gain line, you know, from an attacking point of view, um, what do we need to look at next? So um, if you could fire into the chat um, in, in one or two words, right at this moment here, what's the one thing that we have to referee here in this clip? And don't worry too much about semantics or, or using the right key focus area word. Just what is that? What do you think you have to referee? Who do you think you have to referee right here? Sweet. Uh, and we'll stop there. Like uh, we have a lot of people say tackler. Some people are saying jackler. Um, the answer is kind of a hybrid. Um, it's actually a tackle assist, which we see very, very seldomly nowadays. But we have a player that ends up on their feet, which is here, still holding on to the tackle. Um, and then we, well, what do we have to do with them? Um, they're not a tackler by definition. They're not a jackler because they haven't tried to, to lift the ball after the tackle is made. Uh, they're that tackle assist. Um, and just as a quick definition, uh, all we need to see from them is a release of the tackle for them to become a jackler. Um, so the question I'll ask you, I'll slow this down a little bit more, is if we see that person in contact with the ball, as they are right here, person with the headgear, they go to ground, if they've never really, now they end up in a great jack queen position, able to lift the ball, but if they've never released, well, we have our decision. And what I love about the referee decision here is the referee gets a bit body blocked. And right now, let's say you're the, you're the referee in pink, you see this picture. We don't know if it's a jackler or it's a tackle assist. The referee goes on what they see. And the one fact that's there is, well, we have a player who's lifted the ball clearly. And by the time the whistle's blown, the player stands up with the ball. So um, I don't really care. And, and generally speaking, stakeholders don't care um, if you make an error in a decision. Um, it's just about how you got there. And so if you've decided this was holding on, meaning you're going to reward the jackler, they stood up with the ball. That's great. Um, if you've decided that they were part of the tackle and they didn't let go and you decide that they needed to clearly release, that's great too, as long as we're talking about one thing that we're refereeing, as opposed to looking at the whole cluster and getting involved in things that um, not everyone can follow, if that makes sense. So we'll move on to our second clip. So again, for those of you who just joined, I will repost once again the playlist into the chat. Uh, Chris, one question. Please. In in your your viewing of that tackle, are you trying to catch the tackler assist? Let like releasing the player as part of you watching the tackle be completed. Like that's when you're supposed to catch that, I guess. Because then, yeah, then you, so then you I would say, to... no, no, you're, you're, sorry, go on. And then you want to move to, like, you want to quickly shift to that t tackler, like rolling away, and not in them obstructing the ruckers, right? But like, you want to catch that release happening. Because I, I get a lot of, at the little, at the young kids level, I'll, I'll see a lot of kids try to hold on, the, and then I'll say tackle release, and he's just like grabbing the ball and trying yeah. to rip it out. And so I always find I have to watch that tackle be finished. And in and, and the U18 stuff, it's like a process and it just drags on them trying to all consolidate their thoughts on how to, you know, let the ruck happen. But at that, at, when it's fast, you just catch a glimpse of that, eh? Like hundred percent. So, so tackle assist, generally speaking, uh, it used to be quite a big thing. People always used to try and target the ball before the and kind of ride the player to ground. Um, that was the way people double tackled probably, you know, circa 2017 however in the in the age grade game people grab the ball as you know and, and they and they hug onto the ball they're not really confident in their ability to tackle but then they go to ground and they continue to grab the ball so the first thing that needs to happen like you say is the did the tackle is the tackle completed and if that's the case then they need to let go of the ball 
Um, and it doesn't have to be this massive thing. It just needs to be seen to come off the ball for, for a moment. Um, and, and yeah, I wouldn't even worry about moving on to, you know, Jackler and arriving players and all that stuff. Um, it's just, we've, you've identified that the scenario that we need to referee is this player is locked onto the ball. Now they've gone to ground. They've stayed on their feet, which is great for them. They still need to let go of it, if that makes sense. Hey, Chris, can I just come in with a question for you? Sure. Um, it seems to me in your comments circa 2017, we, we have moved away from pinging the tackle assist. Like, I can't think I, I heard that as a penalty once in the whole World Cup, for example, mm -hmm. the recent men's one. And the, lately the trend has been hitting the no rollout. Like, Jackler, you're fine, but there's no rollout first, penalty on the no rollout. Yeah. So, so are we wanting to reintroduce in BC Rugby Union the, the language of tackle assist? I, I wouldn't say so, Sarah, just because it, it's less it's less common. So, um, you know, th this kind of Division two type environment, um, you're going to have people that are a little bit more upright. They're a little bit more grabbing onto ball. Um, the, the tackles aren't completed kind of as quickly. Um, so I would say, like Bob mentioned, in under 18, under 16, under 14, is when we see that tackle assist. The higher level you go, higher speed collisions that happen. Tackle assist is actually quite rare um, in the sense that most defensive systems, they, they look to chop and then hit below the ball. And if you think about that language, when they chop the legs, well, they're clearly they're going to be the tackler. And when they're going to hit below the ball, they're not actually looking to grab the ball. They're looking to hit the player below the ball in the midsection to try and create that moment of separation or that, you know, um, awkward placement on the ground. So they're not actually looking to contest straight away. They're looking to disrupt. And then the, the better teams at that, they will often have a chop hit below the ball and a third player coming into Jack really quickly. So it's, it's not really a picture we're seeing a lot. Um, as, as clip one being, being a nice and slow one, um, what I want us to think about is, not being overly singular on our approach is just which team are we refereeing here? Um, if we're refereeing the blue team, well, then what do we need to see from the blue team? Because like you say, if you're looking at the World Cup or, or whatever level of rugby you're watching, um, and even in our community, tackle assist is, is very much a rare thing um, unless we go down the divisions or down the age grades, if that makes sense. So I will move on to... Um, I will move on to the second uh, clip. And on this one, I just want you to fire into the chat who you think is under pressure. So it could be black, it could be white. Um, so if you get a chance to watch that um, on your own screen, no problem. I'll play it on my screen. And I'd be very interested in the why here because we have, um, obviously there's a territorial concern, but there's also um, a support concern as well. So. Um, have a watch of clip number two and yeah, who is under pressure, white or black? Sweet. So fire that into the chat when you can. I'm always amazed at some people's ability to write full sentences in a matter of seconds. That's incredible. Sweet. Um, so again, it's not uh, about right or wrong. It's just about how do we get there, um, if that makes sense. So um, I'll fire it open to the group. So if you feel like weighing in, if you are on the camp of black is under pressure, um, yeah, feel free to unmute and, and walk us through why you think that. Yeah, Chris, um, I thought that... You 
clear line break by White. Um, White supporting players getting there in numbers with few black players around. And, you know, my expectation would be um, that White would arrive, secure the ball, clear out any arriving players, assuming they do, Black does join from the correct side. Um, and I'd, I'd have expected White to win this easily. Well, and what I love, and you said one thing, you're basically deciding in your mind, I know what I need to see here. And, and just to go back on what you just said is – you know, assuming black arrives, like if they're going to arrive from the correct side, we might have a contest. Um, so that's really good. So what, where we want to get to in, in any phase where we have to make a decision is what are we actually refereeing? Um, you know, no one really cares if you, if you decide one way or the other, what they care about ultimately, uh, they might, may not be able to articulate it, but what they care about ultimately is, well, how, how did you get there? So, Andy, if I could um, pick on you again. So obviously we we should have a white win here. Um, what are we looking at from this black player right now? What do you expect to see from them, given that they are under pressure and they are under the microscope? Yeah, I'd expect them to um, roll away without impeding any of the white, white support, get to their feet and compete for the ball from the correct onside position. Love that. Um, and, and again, they, they, that's what we're really seeing here. The likelihood of them becoming a credible jackler is quite low. Um, they actually do an incredible job here um, as we see that, you know, they've, they've come off the ball, they're on their side. Um, and just as, you know, if we go back to applying our definitions, um, you know, what do we expect? Well, now they're no longer a tackler. They're not a tackle assist. They're now a jackler. Um, so what do we expect from the jackler? Are they in it? Well, A, like you say, Andy, on their own side. And are they able to lift the ball? And it's actually an incredible piece of work here. So um, I chose this clip quite deliberately because it's it's one of those five, five, six percenters where most people can identify heading into this situation that, yeah, white should have the numbers. Um so black have to do something spectacular or illegal. Um, and, they, and they actually end up on the spectacular side this time. So uh, well done to uh, the tackler who then becomes a jackler. So just as a quick pause for a moment, um, if those of you are like, well, where do you come up with these terms? Like, you know, lifting the ball and all that stuff. I will um, share you the full version, the chat of the, of the key focus areas. And the way these are designed to be used is not to be looked at in sequence as a checklist, but looking at, you know, rugby organically and going, all right, what am I actually looking at? What, what am I needing to referee? Which role am I needing to referee, if that makes sense? Um, I'll shift my screen just for a second here. Okay. And... Sweet. So if you do click on that link, uh, you should be able to see uh, what is on my screen. Uh, and effectively, um, yeah, these are the things that we referee most often uh, in the breakdown, you know, in terms of space, you know, offsides, for lack of a better term, um, at set piece and what we manage. Um, these aren't things that necessarily happen or these aren't people that we're concerned about at every single phase. Sometimes we are, sometimes we're worried about two or three, but most often we're refereeing one thing. Um, so if we can get to a space where we can identify half of the players on the field as people we need to referee, the next step is, can we identify that one or maybe two people? And what what are they doing? What, what role are they occupying? Are they a jackler? Are they a tackler? Are they a person cleaning out? Uh, are they a counter ruck threat? So if we go to that jackler, you can click on here and watch the full... Um, you know, one minute and 49 seconds of what that looks like um, using our, our footage from our leagues. But um, if you didn't have the time to do that, uh, what we want to get to is just get on the same page in terms of our definitions. So 
when we are speaking in the clubhouse before or after the game, um, we just want to make sure that we're on the same page. So uh, mentioning Jackler, um, are they in a position to lift the ball? Uh, we try not to use language like supporting body weight or on off feet or diving versus driving just because it's, it's pretty subjective. Um, speaking with players, coaches, referees um, from different parts of the world in our community and different levels. Um, it's pretty objective to say, are they able to lift the ball or are they not able to lift the ball? So that's that language that we want um, to arrive at. And again, no one really cares whether you make a decision one way or the other. All they care about is how you got there. Um, and again, what do we do as referees? We observe, can we identify if there is a jackler threat? Are they a tackle assist? You know, like you mentioned, Bob, uh, in the U18 games, we're not really refereeing uh, uh, jackler. We're refereeing tackle assist when they're all hugging. We say, okay, tackle, let go. That's the thing we need to see first. But if we do get to that situation where we don't have someone who's part of the tackle and they're going in to compete all we need to ask ourselves is, are they able to lift the ball? Cool. So we'll go one more clip um, and then I will leave it there for this evening. And again, all of the stuff I shared, um, you can have a look at that on your own. Uh, feel free to pop anything into the chat um, on our Coach Logic uh, feed. And again, anytime you want to pick up the phone or send me an email, uh, please, please do so. I'm always happy to uh, develop these conversations further. So what I will do um, before I see what's happening in the chat is I will just go back to our main screen here. And we'll go through one more clip from this evening. So what I'll ask everyone to do is scroll to I'm just trying to get the right time here. So it's clip number four, which is at 317 of that session clips video. I will put it again in the chat for you in case you have lost it. So in this video, I'll go to about three minutes, 17 seconds. And I will ask you a different question and you can fire it in the chat. After watching this clip one time, what's the best possible outcome for this game of rugby? It could be a penalty, it could be a scrum, it could be play on, it could be, um, you know, someone does something cool and scores a try. Given what you've watched, almost like you're you're watching something on TV, um, what is the best possible outcome for the game of rugby um, in this scenario? So again, um, please scroll to 317 um, in the video I just popped in the chat. That's clip number four, if you already have it open. All right, so I will give you to the end of the clip on my screen, which is going to be playing at 75% speed. Watching this whole passage of play, what is the best thing for the game of rugby here?
So just before we uh, we close this evening, just kind of keep try to keep things as close to 45 minutes as possible. Um, for those of you who are like, hey, Black deserves something here. Um, I love that. I just want to know. what we need to be refereeing here. So if if you decide, if you're one of the people that thinks, hey, Black deserves something here, then we need to be isolating this player and we need to decide whether or not they're on their side in a position to lift the ball. If you're on the side of, great, that's a quick turnover and they're running down the field. Blake Mahovich is a bit of a cheat code in Division Two. Um, we get to the other end of the field. Obviously, ball gets turned over again. Um, if you're on the side of, uh, I saw a couple of play-ons or jouets, well done, Riley. Um, you know, the defense were able to consolidate. Uh, they're probably going to exit here. We probably need to play on. The next step of refereeing, and, and what will make this a 10 out of 10 moment, is not so much getting the decisions right, but identifying that, you know, obviously, I, I know Smorts is on the camp of let's penalize this player in white here. No problem. But let's say we've accepted this quick turnover. The kick through has come. The defense is able to regather. They have numbers. We, we would consider this, uh, for lack of a better term, a dead ruck. Given the fact that we want play to happen, Black are probably going to kick the ball back to white anyway. We're going to have more rugby, possibly a try. Who knows? This this play has gone on for about a minute and 10 seconds. It's It's been quite spectacular. If we want jouer and we want play on, the next piece is looking at our referee skills. That's when we use our movement and our communication skills. So if you've identified that the game really needs to play on here and, and this team, they've won the ball, this team are going to get the ball back anyway, the next step would be what can we do to get that continuity when, you know, when there's a dead rock and when there's a, uh, a green zone situation of a team's going to kick the ball back, um, just leave it alone. So that, that would be my kind of open question for reflection um, to kind of post all of you um, in, in the way we referee is these moments happen in a game when we know a team's won. It's very slow, but they're probably going to kick it anyway. What are the tools in your pocket that you can pull out to get that continuity or get that jouet, um, as Riley said? So uh, we will. I have put all of the um, resources and bits and pieces that you can play with um, into the chat. Um, they're all on YouTube and on, on the website and on the Facebook group anyway. But um, in any case, I'll just open it up for um, for a QA for for ten minutes or so. Um, if you wanted to chat about any all, any and all things pressure, um, but before I do that, just a couple housekeeping items coming up. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, Obviously, we've got the availability survey out. Um, 75 out of 112 registered people have responded. That's awesome. Um, our next development session online will be December 13th. Um, I've, uh, I will circulate that registration link very shortly. Um, and again, our Coach Logic team room discussion, the more that people get involved um, on that platform, the more, um, I guess, purposeful we can make these sessions and, and everything else um also good news for those of you who like sevens the, the vancouver sevens invitational is back um it will be the 22nd and 23rd of february um obviously weather uh permitting um it's going to be predominantly um or not predominantly it is going to be a u16 and u18 elite u sevens event um we're going to have eight teams from across bc um and that will be at the McGavin and Thunderbird. So we've we've booked some of the turf pieces in case um, you know weather becomes a factor. Um, and a three day pass to the Canada Sevens is included for anyone who referees at the VSI. Um, I will circulate via email and other pieces, but um, there is a forum if you wanted to sign up for that. Um, and we do have um, hotels 
uh, for all of the referees for the uh, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night, uh, with an option to extend for the um, Saturday night of Sevens weekend. So I'll pop that into the chat right now. And then last piece, uh, our mid-season camp uh, will be between the 12th and 14th of January um, at UBC this year. Um, we've been fortunate to uh, get the UBC coaching staff and varsity team on the men's side uh, to be running a couple of on-field video room and QA sessions with us. Um, and uh, mat match observation activity as well as they play uh, St. Mary's uh, College from California. Um, so I have set up a sign up for that as well, which I will pop into the chat here, but it will also be sent out via the various platforms. Uh, thanks, Doug. It says not accepting responses. I'll turn that on in just a second. Um, so that is it for housekeeping and apologies. Yeah, I will turn off my screen share and if anyone has any questions or, or comments or discussion items about pressure or and how it realizes in a rugby game, um, far away. For those of you who don't, thank you for joining, and um, we uh, will see you around the fields. Thanks, Chris.